Meet Alfred Nobel, the Swedish inventor responsible for the creation of the world's most peaceful award. And dynamite. Now, our little Nobel here was a pacifist, and he intended his exciting invention to be used for construction and mining. But little did our Swede know that when a world leader hears of a device capable of curing an object's need of a violent dismemberment, there are a few things higher up on the to-do list than rocks. Yeah, they're fantastic for breaking apart large rocks and mines. So, how much can I put you down for? German whisper, German whisper, German whisper. 50,000 kilos. Wow, got a lot of mining operations in Germany, huh? <laughs> Actually, these mines are in France. At the end of the day, dynamite found most of its uses on the front lines of war. But while it ultimately wasn't popular for what Nobel intended, at least it retained its core concept of moving large rocks. They were just more pointed. Stories like this aren't exclusive to Alfred Nobel, however. There are a plethora of examples of breakthroughs in science and technology finding uses outside of their original intent, and the discovery of radiation, nukes, and atomic energy are no exception. So sit back and crack open a Nuka-Cola, because today we're talking about some of my favorite nuclear applications in history. Thank you for joining us today, Tim. You ready for your radioactive history lesson? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> good! So, if you turn your attention to the board- ah, Dear God, my legs! They blew off my leg! Have you ever found yourself the victim of a surprise tiger tank attack? Well, if it hasn't happened yet, it will. So when it does, don't be like Tim. Tim forgot the number one rule of anti-German tank safety. Always have a Hawker Typhoon fighter with rocket projectiles on your person at all times. Luckily, you can train your fighter pilot skills in War Thunder, where you can practice mowing down over 2,000 different tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships in the most comprehensive vehicle combat game to date. With meticulously detailed vehicles spanning over a century, you can practice both your anti-German tank safety and your anti-F-16 safety. Uh, did you say F-16? In my safety training sessions, I really loved the accurate damage profiles, so when I shot an enemy's wing or engine, the aircraft would be affected accordingly, instead of just taking some generic damage. So hop in your Hawker Typhoon and practice your safety in War Thunder on PC, Xbox, or PlayStation using the link in the description for a free large bonus pack of premium vehicles, accounts, and boosters. Thank you War Thunder for sponsoring the video. When did you film? that. Pay attention, school's in session. Now, there's a popular saying that all good things come in threes, and this is something that the United States really likes to take to heart. You've got three branches of government, three founding documents, three pirates of the Caribbean movies. <laughs> I think there's five. There's three. And so it's almost poetic that their experimental nuclear cruise missile program also came with three separate phases of mass destruction. Let me introduce you all to Project Pluto. But I thought the whole theme of this video was how nuclear energy was used outside of its original intent. But Cold War arms race project sounds pretty textbook purpose to me. Yes and no, Tim. While Project Pluto was, at the end of the day, a nuclear weapon, don't let the end goal deceive you, for this project had a few unique innovations up its sleeve. It's the Cold War, late 50s and U.S. scientists had a burning question on their minds. Hmm, how do you make a nuclear missile more... nuclear? Sure, you got the nuclear warhead, but that was delivered by thrusters powered by all this weak, conventional rocket fuel. No, no, no. What we really need is a nuclear-powered nuclear weapon. Thus, Project Pluto was born. This here is a ramjet engine, which uses forward motion to ram cold air inside, heat it up, and then use the resulting expansion to thrust the engine forward. This process requires a source of heat, which comes from burning a fuel. But luckily, ripping apart atoms with subatomic particles is also a rather toasty process. So the idea was to stick an unshielded nuclear reactor inside a cruise missile to power a ramjet capable of delivering an extra nuclear present to their Soviet comrades. Welcome to the facility. Uh, just to get this out of the way, I heard you were transferred here due to some HR complaints from your co-workers, so I just want to be clear, we have a zero-tolerance harassment policy here, John. Nah, dude, won't be a problem. I learned my lesson. Good. Anyway, here we have a ramjet engine. It requires a strong heat source to operate. Heh, <laughs> I can think of a few hot things to ram in there. <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. Nuclear energy. John, you're a genius! Uh, yeah, yeah. If this process was successful, it was theorized that the supersonic low-altitude missile, or SLAM for short, would have a mind-boggling range of 113,000 miles, or 7.16 billion gumballs, meaning it would be able to stay airborne for days or even weeks before running out of the glowing juice. While an ICBM could also reach anywhere on Earth, the main benefit of the cruise missile was that it could fly at just 500 feet off sea level, meaning it would be invulnerable to interception and virtually undetected 
undetectable by the technology of the time. To achieve this, air would be blown directly through the unshielded reactor for heat, meaning this little bundle of fun would be showering everything below it with some extra spicy air as it flew by shattering eardrums at Mach 3. Edwin Lyman from the UCS stated that even before reaching its target, the missile would be a quote, flying death factory, with the Nevada National Security site stating it would deafen, flatten, and irradiate people along its path, much like a group of Harley riders. And that's just the first of the three phases of Project Pluto's mass destruction. So then we're taking body shots off the grizzly bear, right? Huh? Say, do you taste iridium? But just like how Harley riders possess the physical urge to rev their engines and ruin a community's morning, so too does our little slam missile desire to rev its engine per se. Only it does so about 8 billion times louder. That's because the missile could hold anywhere from 14 to 26 thermonuclear warheads to drop along its path. Because the only thing better than one nuclear attack is several. Of course, this leaves the third and final phase of destruction, where Project Pluto detonates its own warhead on the last target. One final nuclear ribbon to top off an apocalyptic wake, the American way. Two versions of the nuclear ramjet engine were built and tested successfully, but regardless, the Pentagon was concerned about how this weapon could provoke an escalated Soviet response. Something about a single low-flying cruise missile that drops a few suns as it plays connect the dots across the Soviet Union, all whilst leveling infrastructure, rupturing eardrums, and blanketing pedestrians with copious amounts of cancer sauce, was deemed too provocative. Yeah, and there's room for at least, like, 20 hydrogen bombs in here. Whoa, okay, let's pump the brakes here. This is getting out of hand. Ah, yeah, I agree. It's getting a bit unethical. Uh, so we still on for testing those nerve agents on our own ships and sailors, right? Yeah, actually, let's move on to the sarin gas trials. This, along with innovations in ICBM technology, led the program to be scrapped in 1964. But if you were really rooting for our little flying Chernobyl, don't you worry. In a speech that could be mistaken for a Bond villain audition, it was revealed that another nuclear-powered missile was being developed by everyone's favorite Stalin stan, Root Tootin Putin McShootin himself. And that's not just me talking. The NATO reporting name for the weapon is literally Skyfall. But I remain skeptical skeptical about this missile's future. Surely we can count on our little Putin pie to not do anything rash. Speaking of rashes, step right up, step right up. My name is Dr. Delight, the dazzling, dreamy-eyed devil here to deliver diverting, delicious, and delectable delicacies right to your divine darlings. I've got an item for every need, every pain, every slight, and every bite. Your sweet tooth shan't seek sweeter after one bite of my radium chocolate. Polish those pearly whites with some radioactive toothpaste. Give Timmy a radium scope for the little chap's birthday. Fix that uh, face with some radium cosmetics. We've got radium in your water and radium for your daughter, a bit of radium butter for that filet, and even radium lingerie. We can stuff it up your trunk and even fix your junk, yes! You just name it, and we've got radium in it. So, what'll it be, young lad? My wife is leaving me. <laughs> uh, I've got uh, radium divorce papers. <laughs> a radium vibrator? What? It was just getting good. We can stuff it up your trunk? We can't air this. No, it, what's wrong with it? It's got pizzazz, character, sex appeal. Are you supposed to be doing a history video? Oh shit, that's right. Radium, discovered in 1898 by the unstoppable French power couple, Marie and Pierre Curie, radium is a metallic element that can be found naturally inside of uranium ore and also appears in minuscule amounts in virtually all rocks, soils, waters, plants, and animals. It was quite an exciting metal that took the world by storm in the early 20th century due to its new and practically magical property, radioactivity. Radiation was a new phenomenon at the time, captivating the public who were unaware of its dangers, and instead saw it as this promising and powerful force. Not only did radium give off this new force, but it also glowed really cool. So it began to find itself marketed in all sorts of products, from foods to cosmetics to suppositories, all claiming it had mystical healing properties. This promotion of fraudulent medical pseudoscience is known as radioactive quackery, which is just an adorable name. Radium was pretty much the early 20th century equivalent of healing crystals, only instead of getting laughed at and told to go to the sonic convention with your chaos emeralds, loser, the DNA in your bones got rapidly bombarded by alpha particles from what was essentially nature's chaos emeralds. One particularly interesting radium product comes from the 1930s by the name of Radithor. Despite what it sounds like, Radithor was not some obscure Marvel hero that the MCU dragged into the spotlight for Phase 47, but rather a radioactive elixir containing everyone
everyone's favorite spicy metal. Priced at $5 for a 2 ounce bottle, around $100 today, this potion was quite literally an energy drink as it contained triple distilled water with a minimum of 1 microcurie of radium 226 and 228 isotopes each. It was marketed as a cure for the living dead and a perpetual sunshine that could cure the user's impotence and enhance the body. While today we have 16 year olds dry scooping pre-workout with a cotton candy bang chaser, the chads of the 1930s were practically giving off secondhand skin cancer as they pounded drinks with an ingredient 3 million times more radioactive than uranium. Radithor's most famous customer was Eben Byers, an amateur golf champion who took several doses of the spicy sauce each day, believing it gave him a toned up feeling. A few years later he would die from radiation poisoning after his jaw literally fell off and his bones and tissues began disintegrating. His body was so radioactive that he had to get buried in a lead-lined coffin, and his corpse was still found to be highly radioactive after it was dug up over 30 years later. Now, you're probably curious how a doctor could possibly peddle a health potion containing a substance with very little research around it. And that's because the company owner behind the drink, William J. A. Bailey, was definitely not a doctor as he had dropped out of Harvard but told everyone he was anyway because fuck it. So this can cure my erectile dysfunction? Yeah, dude, I made it myself, I'm a doctor. Oh, score, okay, can I just like throw this in my bag or is the bottle fragile? Oh, it's the strongest, trust me, I'm a material engineer. What? Hey, this is the stuff that killed that golfer. You're gonna end up in jail. Nuh uh, my dad's the president. A and he went to space. The golfer's death led to the demise of many other patents on radiation based medication as the FDA tightened its restrictions. But don't you worry, there are plenty other non medicine based radium products to be sold, such as perhaps my favorite and yet another miracle invention by our lovely William J. A. Bailey, the Radian Doctrinator. Priced at up to 1,000 buckaroos, the device consisted of small pieces of paper coated with radium sulfate and stuffed into a credit card sized metal case with a mesh window. This atomic credit card was touted as the last word in scientific manufacture and was advertised for a variety of uses, such as directing men to put it under their scrotum at night and to quote, radiate as directed. Now, I know what you're thinking, but what if I roll over and my jingle bells don't get the full dose? Don't you worry, champ. It came complete with its own special jock strap to roast them chestnuts overnight. William Bailey would go on to die from bladder cancer in 1949, but perhaps in another timeline, his radioactive quackery would have actually yielded some results. <laughs> 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 Let's take a quick break from talking about history, thank god, and talk about some modern news. No! Back in 2021, there was a peculiar trend of people getting stuck in things. You had people stuck in doors due to physical illness, laundry machines due to mental illness, or the Suez Canal due to comedic incompetence. March of 2021 saw a quarter mile long cargo ship jam itself into the Suez Canal, blocking passage. And while the world's economy took a massive hit, the meme economy couldn't have been healthier. But unfortunately, humor isn't as valuable to the world's leaders is real money, something I plan on changing once I'm elected. So plans have been made to widen the Suez Canal to prevent future blockages, but wouldn't it have been much nicer if we had already had a solution to this problem implemented in the first place? Back in 1963, a United States proposal was considered that would have done just that, pitching the idea to build an alternative to the Suez Canal through the Negev Desert in Israel. However, the 160 mile long canal would have been astronomically expensive to dig with the excavation methods of the time, but as luck would have it, the world had just just invented some fun new toys that were excellent at making big holes. There's no way we could dig all that, we'd never get the budget. Yeah, I mean if only we could just like, nuke our way across it. <laughs> what are you doing? Jim, no. Like a preteen getting their first taste of power in Minecraft creative mode, the plan was to explode a long line of bombs across the desert to dig a Suez alternative canal. To do this, the US would need to use 520 nuclear bombs throughout Israel to excavate the required amount of earth at a ballpark cost of only $575 million. The paper described itself as a crude preliminary investigation, and that using these little nuclear excavators appears to be within the range of technological feasibility. Which doesn't sound all that confident of an assessment, more like some scientist who used to blow up mailboxes with firecrackers as a kid thought, it go boom, and, and then gone. The project would have sought to use nukes only throughout the unpopulated desert wasteland portions of the canal, where radiation wouldn't be a threat to people. 
You know, probably. However, while this idea would have been strategically valuable and eliminated the Suez monopoly on shipping passage, it never got past the proposal stage. This is likely because the paper avoided one big elephant in the room, with itself stating, Another problem which has not been considered is that of political feasibility. You know, whether or not the most politically tense portion of the Middle East would be open to the idea of half a thousand nuclear firecrackers in their backyard. Yeah, so we use four two megaton nukes for every mile along this part! What? I said we'd use four... We'd use four two megaton... Now, if we back ourselves up a little bit to note the first sentence of the memorandum, it reads, Another interesting application of nuclear excavations... Another? You mean... Yes, Tim. This was not the first time the idea of using nukes for digging was thrown around. In fact, out of all of them, this one received the least amount of development. The Israeli Canal Plan was all a part of a larger program by the name of Project Plowshare, an initiative to investigate civilian use of nuclear bombs for peaceful construction. This included ideas such as widening the Panama Canal, carving roads through mountains, nuclear fracking for natural gas, and creating various bodies of water such as harbors, canals, and aquifers. Through 27 different nuclear tests, it was discovered that while the concept would work, the whole nuclear part left things a bit too radioactive for comfort. However, I for one would love some radioactive natural gas. Yeah, we just got this new gas fire pit. No need to worry about inhaling smoke anymore. No sir, my lungs and overall physical health are much better off now on account of the natural gas and all. T Todd, why is the fire green? Here, have a roasted marshmallow. Sup? Project Chariot progressed the furthest out of all of the Project Plowshare initiatives, which sought to create an artificial harbor by blowing up part of the Alaskan coast. It was abandoned because the local Inupiat village protested the plan, causing the US to have a change of heart, and definitely not because it was too expensive. I enjoyed reading about that one because it's not often you hear stories about native villages getting their way, so it's nice to learn that they remain safe from any potential radiation poisoning. Until it was discovered that a few years later, the US had buried nuclear material there anyway, probably causing the recent spike in the village's cancer deaths. <laughs> Oh, America. Whether it was insane or truly ahead of its time, no peaceful nuclear bomb projects ever saw fruition. Except for the Soviets, who actually succeeded in stopping some gas fires. Duh. So, how about it, Sim? Feel like an expert in all things nuclear? Hmm, I mean, those stories are all very interesting, but why is radiation dangerous in the first place? 